whereby uh, we have this, this is both a special lecture because as I located before, you get uh, your food after a long day. And, uh, and, and uh, I remember when we discussed the first time whether the, it should be an evening lecture or, or a dinner lecture or before, and uh, perhaps the less risky solution is this one, less risky from all viewpoints, from your viewpoint and the fact that, that it may, you may after the dinner really go away. <laughs> so it would be not so large a public, okay. And uh, one point is that uh, because of this special arrangement, uh, I mean, in uh, uh, this one, as you can see even from the affinity of the title, is a really a twin lecture with that of yesterday morning. And you will notice, however, this little at. So yesterday I said population health, the core of epidemiology. So really that it is the core of epidemiology. And now, I'm saying that within the population health, at the core, there is prevention. It's not the only one, but I think really it is there in a central position when you think about population health. Now, I go back just to bridge back to what I was saying yesterday and again emphasizing a bit this uh, uh, change of uh, names and this uh, uh, popular uh, uh, popularization of the, of the term population health. And I said yesterday, I don't think it is merely a, a verbal device. It translates something, some perceptions, some changes, changing in orientations. And I just add a few things about that, and then we will move to prevention, to some aspects of prevention, which is an immense domain, and I will point a few specific points, I mean, not necessarily connected one with the other. Now, here is the same slide as yesterday. Here we have the population health, and we have epidemiology, that it is instrumental every, everywhere along all the path leading from this ergonomic materializing this organized effort of society uh, to promote, protect, and restore health that we call public health. And uh, now, when I started in my epidemiology in London in a basement uh, in Gower Street, at that time I was uh, uh, an internal medicine uh, doctor close to here in Pisa. Uh, the starting, what I can call the starting knowledge of a research line, it was, I mean, these are all the density of what we know. I mean, it was quite at this level. I mean, okay. So here is our target, the population health. And the type of research we were doing in epidemiology had the two possible outcomes. Either we were hitting the wall and just, well, it's not pleasant, but I mean, you don't get anything out, I mean, really. The information was really, most of the research ended by, well, say we found something, is unclear the meaning or not. Or, if you were successful, really, we, it was quite easy to have a research which was immediately relevant to health. Now, you are in a much more better, but more problematic situation. The base knowledge from which uh, we start, and you in particular start, is much, much wider. You start and therefore you can get directions which are like that. So much more knowledge, much more opportunities for pertinent and also non-pertinent epidemiological research. You may gain knowledge, but it may not so immediately related to, to health of the population. It may become useful. I mean, you may go in the itinerary, uh, really going, sorry, going there, really. They go up there. I mean, this is the failed research at my period, and this is what happened, may happen today. Go here, then to come back here, you have to do a long detour or something like that. And uh, so this is the present day situation. And this back and forth, I can try to emphasize this uh, with uh, an, a couple of other images. 
I mean, if you have this uh, epidemiology and population health back and forth movement, which I said yesterday, I mean, there is no epidemiology without population health. There is no population health without epidemiology. This uh, plan of oscillation, so to speak, you may have the impression, and I think this is the reason of the coming back to the population health uh, uh, name, that today, when uh, the old days, the plan of oscillation was like that. Either you didn't get out of anything almost from the research, or you were pertinent, almost closely pertinent. Nowadays, we had all of us, I think I'm not only myself because I'm rather old, that, uh, that maybe the plan of oscillation has rotated. We end up in omics, big data, connected objects, functional imaging, gene editing, high tech. Uh, many of these things are very informative. So you enrich enormously the knowledge. Is that knowledge really pertinent to population health? And I think that uh, the, the, the coming back of population health world is also has to do with that. I mean, it has been particularly strong during the first decade of this century, this uh, perception, because of all the genome, a splendid adventure, and so on. And so something seemed to go, well, we need maybe a correction back in the direction of pertinence to population health. And now we can move to prevention. So I have uh, a few, as I said, a few flashes on different aspects of prevention, which I want just to emphasize because are key aspects. First one, well, is not a key aspect, but you will hear about prevention. You have already heard with a type of labels to different stages, phases, and so on. So first is why prevention? Franco Merletti mentioned Jeffrey Rose this morning. Jeffrey Rose who died at the beginning of the 1990s after publishing this book, which I will give you the re full reference at, at the end, really was one of the most uh, competent but also enlightened epidemiologists who had a deep view of the relation really between epidemiology and, and health. And I think he did some seminal work. Really. And then about prevention, he had a very strong statement. He says, it is better to be healthy than ill or dead. That is the beginning and the end of, of the only real argument for preventive medicine. It is sufficient. And that is really one way of putting uh, issues. I mean, and then uh, there are certain things, like Kant was saying, you need to be done. Whether they are costly or not costly, is that not the primary criterion? L like nowadays, I mean, the first criterion in many things comes, is this economically efficient? Is that a, there are certain things that from a Kant would call a deontological approach needs to be done. And that is very much in that the same philosophy, really, that Jeffrey Rose put down this uh, statement at the beginning of his book. Now, in respect to prevention, to uh, epidemiology, you remember now this uh, building, then prevention, of course, flows directly from the epidemiological investigation of etiology, because uh, it tries to attack uh, the roots of the disease, and then, of course, it flows is in the other sector of uh, epidemiology, which is the evaluation of the preventive measures. And now, these different labels that you come across, and in part uh, they overlap, in part uh, uh, interfere one with the other. You can have different uh, ways of looking at the prevention uh, intervention. So there are prevention levels in the population, which we can call an epidemiological criterion. So the primary, to reduce incidence of disease, that is the standard. The secondary is to reduce the prevalence of disease by shortening the duration. So that is, uh, is early diagnosis is here. 
And then the tertiary is to reduce the number and severity of disease complications. So because you start from there. So you know, most of you know that. Then you can have the prevention stage, and that we can call a causal criterion. I mean, because you act at the causes at the different stages. So you have the primordial. In, fundamentally, there are only two series of K, two, two categories of, K, of causes. I mean, both for health, healthy bodies, and, and, and uh, 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 sick bodies. I mean, either they are in the environment or are within the body starting from the zygote. I mean, so the, either they are genetic or they are uh, environmental. Then there are a series of other factors which evolve as the, the organism moves from the initial one cell and develops uh, uh, <coughs> in, in intrauterine life and then uh, outside, in the outside world. Then there is the primary, again, defined, however, from a different angle on host risk condition. And here, where the screening for risk factors comes in, the secondary on early disease, and this is screening but for early diagnosis, not for predictive or hopefully predictive risk factor, and then the tertiary again on the clinical disease. And finally, you have a prevention extent in the population, which you can call a demo demographic criterion. It can be universal, targeted on the whole population, like when you do some big environmental measurements, or when, uh, when you, you, like there, uh, at present here in this country, uh, a big debate about uh, uh, children vaccination, whether everybody should be vaccinated or not, whether it should be compulsory or not. Then there is sectorial, which is targeted on, on population sector, identified by easily, easily uh, known sociodemographic variable, like gender, age, place, old people, vaccination against influenza, and then selective, which is much of what becomes possible, potentially, targeted on groups and individual identified by a diagnostic or screening test, which is much more close to a clinical prevention uh, approach. Okay, so the first thing. The second aspect is the so-called prevention paradox, which has been something that Jeffrey Rose really has put in a clear way. I mean, the prevention, I put principle because it's not a mathematical principle or a logical principle. It is an empirical, uh, uh, an empirical principle which comes out of a lot of concordant data, but it doesn't apply like a principle universally all the time of the circumstances. So, just you can state it in the world, in words, that a large number of people at small risk usually generate many more disease cases than a small number at high risk. And in every circumstance in which this, call it principle, applies, the paradox follows that preventive measures bringing large benefit to the community offer little to each participating individual. This is not the case, for instance, for vaccination against infectious diseases. I mean, because, I mean, the, the benefit is also to the people who are vaccinated first, but it's also to the whole community because of the herd immunity, really, and the fact of the, you stop the circulation above certain level of uh, vaccinated people. You stop, basically, the circulation of the, of the uh, <coughs> microbes of the agents that are really the etiological agents of the disease. And therefore, the prevention principle leads to two approaches in prevention, the high risk versus the whole population approach. Because, I mean, if the load of the cases come basically from the totality of the population, you would approach the problem in a different way than if you focus only on the very high risk people. And the two approaches can be contrasted or in, in practice, and it, it, they are certainly contrasted in concept. In practice, they may be also comp uh, complementary or in a balanced way or in an unbalanced way. They certainly raise 
a big problem for public health. Now, here is the example, for instance, from the Mr. Fit data, it was one of the big studies uh, on uh, coronary heart disease in the United States. And then there is the percentage of these graphs is somewhat a bit complex, but I'm mean, trying to explain it. Uh, this is a percentage of uh, ischemic heart disease deaths actually attributable to different levels of cholesterol, okay? One of the classical risk factors, host risk factors for uh, ischemic heart disease. Now here you can see in this the histogram is the distribution of the cholesterol level in millimoles per liter and there are the different levels in the population, okay? So it's the blue histogram. Here is the dose response of the exposure response uh, a curve for ischemic heart disease on six years per thousand men. You can then convert this in, in, in uh, uh, rate, uh, mortality rate per hundred thousand or whatever. But these are the data directly for the Mr. Fit data. And here the numbers gives you the percentage of the total deaths due to ischemic heart disease that, that are occurring in e for each of these categories of, of cholesterol level. And you can see that if you take up only the tail of the distribution, the high risk, so you have 13 plus 9, 22 plus 8, it makes 20 percent. The 80 percent are really occurring Bill all up to the level of 6.25 uh, millimole. I mean, that you will see also in the next graph. I mean, so the cholesterol level and percentage of the population, I mean, 24, bigger than 6. The 11 are within the 24, bigger than 6.5 millimoles, bigger than 7, 5, and bigger than 2. Okay. Now, how many, and that is what it is from the, from the previous, uh, from the figures that you just showed, uh, that you have seen just now. So percentage of that actual is 49, so half. If you take six as a cutting threshold for identify the high risk people. But if you want really to go to the tail of the distribution in order to concentrate on the small proportion of people, on the top 10 percent, 11 percent of the people in the population of the Mr. Fit had values higher than 6.5, and they, they include only 30 percent. I mean, 70 percent, the bulk occurs for lower level. Now, what you would like to have, hypothetic, is to have 100 percent, 100 percent, 100 percent, and then 65 percent just in the very extreme. Uh, this would be very convenient because it would mean that only 35 percent would be below 7 and everything just in this tail, you will make a, a big gain in approaching and then concentrating only on this extreme tail of the distribution. And that would be a pictured in this way, you would, you would have a, a do but in order to have that, you would need to have a dose response curve with a sharp, uh, steep increase. Uh, and usually it's not the case, really. The curve, it goes up uh, smoothly and therefore creates that uh, paradox of prevention. Now, of course, you can try and prove the situation as it is immediately taking into account not only a single variable, and that is what is done when you take, for instance, it is in, translated in the prediction uh, <coughs> chart uh, for ischemic heart disease. I mean, that you put together, when you calculate a score, I mean, a risk score, and the risk score is based basically on, on age, which is a dominant factor. Sometimes you are surprised how much age, once you have inserted age inside. I mean, all the other variables contribute relatively little or marginal. Then you have cholesterol, blood pressure, uh, and uh, smoking and diabetes. And you can see that, uh, in fact, the rates when you put cholesterol and diastolic blood pressure goes up when you have the high level of cholesterol and high level of uh, diastolic blood pressure in non-smokers 
And then for, you see that the scale here goes up from 0 to 8 per 6 years per <coughs> uh, thousand men. And then if you look in the smokers, the scale changes, it goes up till 15. So you gain by combining the three variables. Still, you may not reach really that very high risk that you want to have in the high in, in the tail on the, on the multivariate distribution so that it would allow you to focus on a very small proportion of the population and at the same time by doing that preventing their get rid of the, of the burden of the disease in the whole population really. So you have to play in that and that is a central concept. I mean I, I just figure out even from the British doctor study that you will have already I don't know whether it has already been mentioned, but it will certainly be mentioned throughout this course. It's a classic study by Richard Dole and, and Brad Forhill on the British doctors on the effect of smoking. It's a, it's a court which has reached 50 years of follow-up. Now it will be 60 years of follow-up. I mean, and then, and then if you take the the early, the, it, it was started in the 50s, so in the 71 follow-up, but by the time that uh, uh, this type of effect uh, in this particular case, I just pick up this because it's usually, I mean, it, also, it, it shows, it makes uh, the same point of the burden of disease uh, between high risk and, and the bulk and the majority of the population. You can see this effect in a, one of the very early follow-up, which is not so early, it's 20 years follow-up. Now we are at 60. Because as the court uh, ages and disappears, I mean, the time effect becomes dominant over the average smoking uh, uh, of cigarette per day. And so you cannot see so clearly the effect. But you can see that this is really 25 the excess so you have here the distribution in the population as it was in the british doctors 12 percent 29 percent 18 percent and 9 percent were really strong smokers or 25 plus cigarettes per day you may wonder where there are the others that 32 were ex smokers so this adds up to 100 and you can see really that this in which are the really strong uh, smokers those smoking more than two packs, uh, uh, more than uh, the packs of one, 10 or 20 nowadays? 20, 20 usually, yeah. So if you put uh, more than one uh, uh, pack, you see that you have 39% here. So the 60% are, are here. I mean, the 61% are of those who smoke, smoke up to more or less one pack per, per day. So it's the same effect. Now, related to this, there is another critical point, which has been pointed out by Nick Wald in several papers. Now, one of the, one of the basic uh, uh, operation you try to do when you reason in terms of high risk is to try and identify individually the people who are actually at high risk, okay? So you try to have predictive tests. All the, uh, I mean, the cholesterol is one, the blood pressure is another one, you calculate the score and so on. Now, in this frame, you have to, however, to take into account, again, I mean, it's related to what I have been saying, uh, till now, but is looked at from a slightly different perspective, uh, you have to take into account how really the result will come at the end when you know really what has been happening. Now this is a, is a figures in which you have the distribution of people, say of myocardial infarctions affected, the red one, and then the unaffected after a period of follow-up. Okay, so at the end of the story, you have this true normalized distribution. Okay, here you had a test which is now not anymore cholesterol, it's been arbitrary unit. Suppose you have put your cutoff point, of which we have been speaking 
uh, uh, till now. I mean, in terms of millimoles, now is a universal test. The uh, units are here. Here is the cutting, is the cutoff point between those that you predict will develop the disease and then those who you predict will not develop the disease. You have to make some kind of compromise. I mean, and then, okay. Now, so this in, in, in green, pale green, is the false positive. Let us say 5%. You fix it there at 5%. You don't want more than 5% false positive. Otherwise, you are, you are in trouble, really. And then what happens? After the fact, the correct prediction here would be 25%. But what it is interested is that if you play with this and you come up with a with the cutoff you, and with the different levels of uh, risk factors, you have a rather striking picture under some rather weak assumption. The, the distribution of the variable should be normal and then or can be normalized by taking logs and so on. Now, you have uh, the variable and you measure the relative risk. I call the variable you, the cholesterol, the blood pressure. Variable is a determinant. And the risk, relative risk, is the top versus the bottom fifth, the two extremes of the distribution, okay? So 20% here and 20% here, the relative risk between these two. The relative risk between these two is one, okay? And so you keep fixed the level of the false positive. So by definition, this is 5% because you fix for a 5%. I don't, I want a cutoff really at 5% false positive. So now the relative risk goes up three, and then how many correct prediction you do? 10% only of the people who will develop the coronary, the, the myocardial infection are correctly identified. For a relative risk that from a point of view of etiology is very important, three is not 1.2 or something like that. And then in order to have really good classification, you need to go up to very high relative risk. Now, that may stand up within the assumption, which are mild assumptions that have made with this kind of model, but it brought, brought, brings in the general concept that a, a variable which may be have a, a an important risk in terms of relative risk, really it, it, it cannot necessarily be a good predictor at the individual level. So it is important as an etiological factor, but the, uh, as far as, as you are trying to identify correctly individuals, I mean, it may be a poor, a poor predictor. Okay, so that's the other important point. However, there are situations when the high-risk strategy works marvelously. Well, that's a very peculiar situation, but luckily they are not that rare. Now, we were looking for high relative risk, and here we have some very high relative risk. Look at this. I mean, and that has been one of the great successes of epidemiology. And uh, one of the main contributors to this success was my colleague, Nubia Munoz from Colombia, who worked all ca her career at the International Agency of Research on Cancer. She has been really carrying the uh, seminal studies in uh, Spain and Colombia, uh, and, then, uh, and then synthesizing other studies as well, for instance, in this uh, slide on squamous cell cervical cancer, which is a, 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 an important uh, uh, prevalence uh, <coughs> cancer in developing countries. And you have this huge relative risk. And, uh, and the, you can see, and that is a very special situation, because, I mean, the variety, the strain of the virus that are really most important are the 16 and the 18, 
and then you f they are found in 70 percent of the uh, of the cases. I mean, and <clears throat> and then then you have other strains, and you go down. I mean, to the fact that you have a really a very high percentages, and in general, I mean, it's now uh, believed that the prevalence of the human papilloma virus uh, is a necessary, one of the not very common cases in which really you have a necessary cause, uh, 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 and then that, uh, that you have there, not just something that increases the risk. It must be there really in order to have, uh, to have the cervical cancer. Well, in such a situation, in fact, you have a, your screening test in this situation really works yes or no, and you don't have a, a variable distribution like for cholesterol. It is positive or negative. Of course, you may have some fluctuation, but it's simply the range of measurement, whether the test is positive or negative. That is the instrumental error which for cholesterol is added to the inter-individual variability. Really, here you have only a yes or no with some error in the measurement. If you replicate, you can virtually reduce to no, almost nothing that, that error. And then, and then you know that there's just mentioned in some successes of prevention. I mean, and then now there are campaigns. And you can see even from this very incomplete data, which were quoted last year, by Dr. Lowy, who is the deputy director of the National Cancer Institute in the United States, he is emphasized limited, or we could put is although limited, HPV vaccine uptake in US has led to decreased prevalence of HPV 16.8 in 14, 19 year old girls. 51% received one or more doses, so only 55%, you can look in that way. And so you can see that, uh, uh, that uh, <clears throat> for the strains except 16 and 18, which were really the, the one for which the vaccination was introduced, the change between 2003 and 2006 was only a 10% decrease. I mean, this remains really almost unchanged and was a, 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 a massive decrease really in these two high risk HPV 16, the 16, 18 are the high risk strains. And then it, there was a fall of 61% decrease, very, very clearly different from this one. Although there was limited uptake only 51%. Uh, there are other data coming up, particularly from Australia, where really the, the vaccination has been much more, uh, the coverage is much higher. They are going clearly in the same direction. And here are the results of a randomized trial published in 2016 by <coughs> a group led by Dr. Shankar in, uh, in, <coughs> in India and in which they are trying really comparing uh, uh, in a court uh, in a court study two uh, three or one dose of this quadrivalent now there are not only the 16 and 18 but there are other two in HPV strains and you can see the curves essentially the key point here I mean there are many more data I mean about this I mean the, you can see that the two and the three uh, doses are really overlapping curves, I mean, in respect to the others which are less. And then, of course, if you can reduce the vaccination course from three to two is already, is already an advance. I mean, and another trial is taking place in Costa Rica. The ideal thing would be to be able to reduce it to one, I mean, uh, dose. Okay, so that is about primary prevention really go in that direction. Then the other, uh, some people don't like at all to, to call it prevention, but though it's what I call secondary, and then it certainly comes under the great, the big chapter of early diagnosis. Some people simply say prevention is primordial or primary, and the rest is early diagnosis, which may be to some extent more appropriate 
at least in context in which people tend to confuse the two and they forget about the primary and they just essentially talk about a, a kind of clinical only approach, I mean, to early diagnosis. Now, early diagnosis, really, I mentioned when before the fact of shortening the duration of disease, and in fact, I mean, it's a bit, the picture is a bit more complex. So here the, in panel A, you have the normal, well, the, the, the course without any kind of attempt at early diagnosis or early diagnosis via screening. Uh, you have the usual care, you have it detectable by screening in principle, but here is the usual care picture. You have the appearance of symptoms, and then soon or, or not so soon later you have the diagnosis and then soon or not so soon you have the start of the treatment. You have the light expectancy and you have serious consequences if nothing else because life expectancy st stops here and then the person is dead. So that is the natural unnatural course, I mean natural because it goes on, unnatural because within ordinary care in a country, I mean whatever that is. Now the p panel B, you have the situation in which you manage, maybe within the ordinary clinical context, by increased awareness and so on, to have the diagnosis uh, anticipated. It's still here, the appearance of the symptoms and the diagnosis is almost immediately since the first symptoms, uh, provided that not everybody becomes hypochondriac by looking at themselves, I mean, all the time and seeing what the symptoms are of all possible 10,000 diseases, because that would be a, a very, a very uh, <coughs> negative side effect. The start of treatment, and then usually if you have a, 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 a a better, a, a more, uh, <clears throat> an earlier diagnosis, well, you may expect some prolongation of life expectancy and then reduce serious consequences. And then finally, you have the situation where you apply a screening. I mean, so the screening works at a stage of the disease in which the disease subclinical becomes detectable by some test. Okay, and so you anticipate quite a lot the diagnosis, you start the treatment, and then you have a much earlier treatment. And you hope and then th that this situation uh, holds significantly improve life expectancy and less serious consequences. Now, this dotted line, however, is the question mark. What you have to test with the appropriate studies, whether these two situations, B and C, really apply, or whether in fact what you do by anticipating the diagnosis, either at the immediately after the appearance of the symptoms, or through a screening uh, test and the screening program, really change the expectation of life. Because if, if instead the expectation of life remains this one, you haven't changed much. Maybe you had had a period in which you had less, uh, less heavy uh, or better quality of life, maybe. But that is the key, the key point uh, to be investigated epidemiologically for uh, when, you, um, when you try and study early diagnosis procedure, whether they are simply an improvement in clinical practice, ordinary clinical practice, or through uh, the use of an organized screening program. Now, <coughs> let me I'll come back to this. Uh, and so the organized screening program is in fact a public health activity, really, because there is the sporadic con. In some countries, really, it's almost become indistinguishable because every doctor, I mean, uh, automatically prescribes mammography or something like that. So, but the concept of an organized program, which is offered to all women, and, uh, 
it's after a certain age, is that is a public health activity and it is organized as such. Now what is happening, and I cannot go into details, is that of course if you have a high frequency of so called spontaneous uh, screening, I mean just occurring in a country, and you try to introduce an organized program, as it has happened in, in, in recent studies, you can't see any difference. But the, the any difference is that because really everybody has already the program. I mean, if you, so it depends really how, whether it is worthwhile to introduce it, it depends what is the, the normal reference ordinary practice in a, in a, in a country. And then it is strange, but uh, the criteria for uh, making <coughs> worth an organized screening program, it, uh, whether it is for breast cancer, colon cancer, are still largely really those, and I say time on or put forward by Wilson and Jungner, I mean in 1968, almost 50 years ago. I mean, not just because I am old again, I'm simply because when you go, I've even recently, I had the discussion and said, but these are Wilson and Jungner criteria. Oh yes, but these were old. Well, I mean, if they said that and it was correct, why, I mean, they are not, uh, they're probably even dead, I mean, the authors, I'm pretty sure, but it's not a good reason. I mean, Newton is dead, but the, I mean, the, 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 the apples are still calling, I mean, and, and, and falling down. I mean, so, I mean, it's, it's not an argument. I don't want to go, but I mean, it starts by saying the disease should be an important health problem in order to have to the whole population, there should be an established and an accepted treatment because the screening is a screening program, it's not a test. The test is just one part because if you test and then you don't have the facilities, the treatment is not there in principle or the treatment is there in principle but you don't have the facility, is not work and so on. And there are about 10 criteria, and then I mean really you, you will have them here. And then just for having one example of how, I mean, in one area which is uh, uh, evolving, I mean, HPV testing, and so this is the program, I mean, a program for cervical cancer again, and then it's the, the, uh, one of the cases in which we have competing uh, testing uh, to, as an entry point into the program, and HPV testing on the virus, on the presence of the papilloma virus, can prevent more cervical cancer than the classic PAP test. And then uh, this is a study by Dr. Ronco from the group uh, in Turin, and then in which they put together different four trials, and you can see very clearly this is all randomized, these are randomized trials, four, and then the pool results, and you can see really that the cumulative, uh, cumulative uh, <coughs> detection rate of cervical cancer here for all randomized women, I mean, is clearly differentiated, I mean, for those who had uh, an experimental arm and the control, and the control arm, I mean, with the pap. And the women with a negative test at entry, of course, the two curves, because the, te the test was repeated yearly, you can see here that the, the, the two curves were not differentiated, but then again, it, it started to be a clear difference. I mean, and then uh, in respect to the control arm, which was the classical cytology pap test. Okay. Now, let us go back to prevention to get some conclusion. So uh, keep in mind that uh, apart from all the other labels, it has, well, you can talk currently, a prevention is an objective, attain or to be attained, which is disease prevention, and then there's an instrument, say, we are doing prevention, so there are preventive actions. And uh, I apologize for this uh, self-quotation. I simply self-quote because in 1978, I mean, so it's old as well. But it just says to argue, it just ties up with Jeffrey Rose's 92 uh, uh, argument. I mean, the, he was much more concise than me. I have a tendency to talk a bit more. In fact, it's 10 to 8. I won't keep you more than that. 
Two arguments stand on the side of prevention. Not to get ill is safer and usually less discomforting and limited of personal freedom than to be attacked by disease and be treated to an earlier late stage. As a corollary, prevention can also be seen as intrinsically egalitarian, suppressing the differences between disease and non-diseased people. And preventive measures measure may be or may be made less costly. On this ground, prevention can be regarded as eminently reasonable, although ambitious aim for etiological oriented epidemiological research. If you want to synthesize this, you can say why should be a core priority really for population health. Effective prevention is technically radical, of course, because you wipe out the disease. Effective prevention can be socially egalitarian. Effective prevention can be made economically convenient. And then, of course, health programs, including the prevention, is not that it's exempt for this problem, can be, may fail. And we have examples where it can be started on inadequate evidence of effectiveness, but just because it's some propaganda of something uh, uh, new. Uh, started on inadequate evidence on critical socio-economic policy or ethical aspect and started taking an administrative rather than technical and managerial approach. You just make a law and everybody had to follow and then you ask people how many people are following this actually. Oh, there is a law. Well, okay, I mean, uh, that's, that's a paper thing. And then finally, I quote again Jeffrey Rose because this is really something which we are unable to cope, and I don't know what the solution is. This paragraph is almost never quoted from his book. I mean, he, he just says, the methods of political world, propaganda, or of the commercial world, advertising, should have no place in medicine. The difficulty is the massive amount of persuasion that comes from the other side, tobacco, drink more vodka, drive bigger and faster cars, smoke tobacco. Maybe freedom suffer less if it is a car attack from both sides, not from only one. On that ground alone, I grudgingly allow that persuasion as some place in health education. Then comes the second part. Such a misgiving is shared by few health educators most of whom measure their success simply by the extent of behavioral change achieved, just as advertisers assess their success by an increase in sales of the product. So underline this, there is a very ambitious uh, objective of Jeffrey Rose. He was saying the objective should be whether a person has been able to make a real free choice, which is a difficult thing to assess and really can't. So uh, the final sentence is damning because it says, indeed, the same advertising agencies are often employed both by commercial companies and by health education agencies, and they use much of the same techniques for both uh, their masters. So this is public health marketing, which is done, we all do to some extent, but I want this to remain in your mind anyway, because it's a fundamental moral lesson that comes for Jeffrey Rose. And here there are two to conclude, two plus one references. I think these two books should be read by all epidemiologists. I mean, they are must. This is Rose's strategy of preventing medicine. Uh, Katie Coe and Michael Marmot have re-edited the book in 2008 and they have an introduction uh, rather long in which they support the argument of Jeffrey Rose. It's a small book, it doesn't cost much. The second one is nothing to, it's a completely different thing. It came out in 2016, I found it uh, fascinating. It's by Branko Milanovic, an economist uh, previously at the World Bank, now the City University of New York. He works on the so-called Luxembourg uh, study of social inequalities, and he gives you an overall picture of how the world is going on the seven 
billion people we are. Global inequality, a new approach for the era of globalization. The final sentence of this book was in the form of an interview to the author. And then the interviewer asked, do you think that in the future, I mean, the, uh, <coughs> the benefit uh, of, uh, of globalization will be more equally uh, distributed or not? And the response was, no. <laughs> I mean, and it's not, a dra it's not an imprudent people. You will see really in detail how much he uh, designed the scenarios. The third book, the plus one, is simply because it, I think is bound to make popular the population health concept. I'm, it is interesting. It is interesting. It has some interesting chapters. What surprises me is that really what they call population health science is fundamentally epidemiology. I mean, and they had the word epidemiology, I look at the index, in one place or the whole 250 pages. I mean, and this all, most of it, I know that, uh, that, uh, that it, uh, we all know from what I have been saying that uh, in order to make the, the prevention, you, you have to add many other things, health economics, I mean, uh, operational research and so on. But the core is epidemiology. Now, I don't know. That, that's, so while I am convinced of the need, because it's the name of the game of population health, about population health science, I mean, as a, as a label, I have all my skepticism. I mean, and I conclude with this. Is somebody daring some questions? <laughs> or the food is really, the glycemia level is going down? <laughs> hmm? I was just wondering if you have any thoughts about all the screening programs which are now being massively implemented, <sighs> at least in the Scandinavian countries, in terms of all the false positives. And yeah. the concerns and worrying that people don't have to live with yeah. It's a side effect, which is not often included in Indeed. the preventive measures. Well, I mean, the, the whole problem, I mean, it seems to me that about, uh, about the, the, the screening program is really the false positive issue, really. I mean, it's, it's if you have even a small percent, I mean, it depends what is, well, one key point that, uh, I mean, I have, it will come up, I hope, during the course, is that really the, and it is automatically, uh, you just think about the prevalence of the disease. If you, the disease that you are trying to screen is, uh, is uh, in the order, the, the prevalence of 1%, I mean, or something like that, which is usually, I mean, and the, and the test has an error of more than 1%, I mean, and then the false positive. So you have, by definition, you have more false positives than you have true positives. I mean, so really other, uh, no, there is, I mean, the heaviest, but I don't know, uh, I'm not update with the Scandinavian. I was used to come to Sweden quite a lot, I mean, 10 years ago, but I mean, now I'm, I'm not so familiar with the country. You mean about colon cancer? No, I don't think that is the case. Prostate is a, is a, is a, is a, is a, yeah, well, breast cancer, for instance, I mean, it just, this is a critical, that one is a debated and it has taken such a, such a bitter tones, I mean, between different groups. I mean, I'm told by those who work in this area that people cannot really speak anymore to each other, which is really, it becomes, I mean, if science becomes like that, I mean, really, it's, it's impossible. You can be antagonistic with somebody, but that, that has been really the breast cancer, but certainly, it depends on the context. I mean, the Swiss, they, three years ago, there was a report in which, in, like everything in Switzerland, I mean, it's largely based on cantons. There is some uh, general policy as well, I mean, in the federal level, but a, a lot of initiative are the canton. If I'm not wrong, a, 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 I mean, the group of, uh, it was uh, Peter Uni, I mean, uh, had a, was chairing a, a, a panel and some canton in Switzerland have this organized program, or, I mean, for breast cancer. 
And they came to the conclusion that it was not worth to setting it up in the other cantons based on false positive, false negative, uh, false positive issue, based on the gain, actually. I mean, but the reason is that they, they came up like that. I think there is a component, I mean, of that in that report, is that in a country like Switzerland, the so-called spontaneous screening ordered by the doctors is all quite high. I mean, so if you, if you, if you graft that type of program, organized, imagine in a place in which the medical practice is very poor, of course you will see a, a, an effect, even if there are false positives, would be beneficial. So it's so much dependent in certain situations, really, when the effect is not so spectacular like it is, like in HPV, which is a particular clear-cut situation, really, one of the, the big successes. And it will be very important because it's a highly prevalent cancer in developing countries. So in others, it's really the assessment is, should be really area-specific or population-specific. OK, well, I think that you have been patient for one hour. I don't want you to become impatient or uh, patient in another sense. So thank you again for staying on after a very long day. <laughs>